a illustrious career, uh, which I am now introduced to you. It's Professor Donald Carbuth, who's a, an emeritus professor of sociology and social and political thought, and a senior scholar at York University in Toronto. He's a training and supervising analyst in the Canadian Institute of Psychoanalysis and the current director of the Toronto Institute of Psychoanalysis. Former, actually, David. Former, okay, former, okay. After completing a doctorate comparing and contrasting sociological and psychological theories of human nature, um, he helped found the Canadian Journal of Psychoanalysis, and he is a past editor-in-chief. He's published many papers. He also has a, a, a strong presence uh, for a theoretician and a psychoanalyst on YouTube. And I, I do recommend, I watched two tonight, uh, this afternoon before this talk, and it's just excellent. It's just sort of... Thank you. For me, um, deal with some of the things that I'm most anxious about if I stand up in public and talk at the moment. And I was watching uh, some of the uh, Oxford Union talk this afternoon with um, Caroline, Caroline Stock, um, which was disrupted by some of the transgender activists. And, um, you know, one is actually finding it more and more difficult to, to speak with authority about the unconscious rather than agree with a particular theoretical position. Um, I said to somebody uh, before I gave a talk recently, "You fear I'm a white Eurocentric heteronormative cisgender patriarch, and I should be deposited in the dustbin of history." <laughs> that broke the ice, you know. Things, uh, <laughs> in a way, being able to name what was most threatening to some extent allowed for a real discussion to take place. Um, but yes, it is. It is. A, it can be quite scary, I think, speaking as a psychoanalyst and challenging theories. Uh, rather than agreeing with them. And I think psychoanalysis and psychotherapy at the moment is being challenged in this way. So I can think of no better person than uh, speaker tonight, uh, Professor Don Cardiff. So I'm going to introduce him now. His talk tonight is Marching Under the Banner of the Superego, Notes on the Mania for Approaching. Don, over to you. Uh, there's a Q&A at the bottom. People can put questions in as we go along, which is quite nice. Then we build up a sort of body of questions. Uh, or at the end, just put up, you know, you know the ro ro rotor by now, just put, up, put your hand up and join in. It's really nice if people can put their screens on so we're not just talking to a blank screen. We've moved on from that now. Okay. 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 Don, over to you. Thank you, David. It's very nice to be with you. Um, the first phrase in my title, Marching Under the Banner of the Superego, comes from the work of my old friend and mentor, Eli Sagan. And the second phrase, notes on the mania for reproaching, that's a phrase used by Heinrich Racker. Um, the, um, the talk is adapted really from my book, the new book called uh, Guilt, A Contemporary Introduction, Rutledge 2023. Uh, I, I don't know that it's in bookstores yet, but it's about to be. So I have an epigram at the start. Let the woke who are not authoritarian call out the woke who are. Okay. Like other animals, human beings have an innate aggressive reaction to pain and frustration. In addition to the secondary or surplus frustration arising from environmental failures, trauma, abuse, deprivation, etc., there is the primary frustration that is part of what Freud, in Civilization and Its Discontents, called our human malaise, and that is nobody's fault. Even with the most attuned and optimally responsive caretakers imaginable, infants and children will encounter inevitable frustration. We cannot have our cake and eat it too. A sibling will be produced by the, quotes, faithless mother. No one gets out of here alive. Much of our frustration, pain, and suffering is existential. It is not mother's fault though she may have made it worse. It is not capitalism's fault, although capitalism has in some ways made it better 
and in many ways made it worse. All this frustration, both basic and surplus, generates aggression. Much of this aggression will be turned away from the caretakers and back against the self. This self-directed aggression is the core of the superego and generates punitive or persecutory guilt. Against all attempts to reduce the superego to socially internalized morality, Freud anchored it firmly in id aggression, turn back against the self. Those of us who reject the idea of a death instinct or an innate aggressive drive see reactive aggression as the primary layer of the superego to which socially internalized norms, folkways, mores, and laws are added as a second layer. Inevitably saddled with a superego loaded to varying degrees with reactive aggression, we inflict persecutory guilt and shame upon ourselves and upon others. It seems we are so constituted that we cannot hate without hating ourselves for our hatefulness. Regrettably, Freud and his followers mostly associated the superego with the moral and immorality with the id. Often failing to appreciate the immorality of the superego, its racism, sexism, heterosexism, classism, etc. And also failing to see the morality of the pro-social as distinct from the anti-social id. Both the immorality of the superego and the morality of the pro-social id. That is, our biologically based drive toward attachment and the altruistic tendencies we share with other primates. In Freud's own work and that of his followers, guilt, the unconscious need for punishment, moral masochism, and the harsh critical superego were of central concern. But by some point, in the late 1950s and early 1960s, a general loss of interest in these issues became apparent. Writers such as Sandler in England and Arlo in America were noticing a turning away from the dynamics of the superego in our literature and our ways of conceptualizing clinical material. In 1973, Carl Menninger was asking, whatever became of sin? Sometime in the 80s, I submitted a paper entitled, Whatever Became of the Superego? to an analytic journal, receiving no response for a considerable time, I finally inquired and was told that the paper had somehow gotten lost. <laughs> In much of the revisionist psychoanalysis that emerged over the past half century, the evasion of guilt and both the superego and the conscience, the psychic regulators that generate guilt, is evident. These theoretical developments, in my view, regressions, in the microcosm of psychoanalysis are paralleled in the socio-political macrocosm 
by the unrelenting attack on regulation and regulators that characterizes neoliberalism and market fundamentalism. This is a little Marxist contribution here in which ideas, part of the ideological superstructure and psychoanalysis is a part of that, is uh, in the last analysis determined, although not strictly, but still in the last analysis by the socioeconomic substructure, neoliberalism sweeping our society and culture and psychoanalysis follows suit in uh, losing sight of the regulators, the superego and the conscience. As we approach the new millennium, Leon Wormser in 1998 was referring to the superego as, quotes, the sleeping giant of contemporary psychoanalysis. While the giant slept, having been anesthetized in both society at large and the psychoanalytic thinking it encouraged, late capitalism had become increasingly unregulated and the stage was set for the economic crisis of 2007-2008. The flight from self-regulation, superego guilt and conscience in psychoanalysis paralleled deregulation in the economy and society. It was no accident that the forgetting or evasion of guilt in psychoanalytic thought coincided with the shift from productive industrial to consumer capitalism, the emergence of what Christopher Lash called the culture of narcissism, and the hegemony of neoliberalism. Ironically, the psychoanalytic preoccupation in the 1970s and 80s with the states of shame and fragmentation suffered by narcissistic characters incapable of bearing reparative guilt coincided with the flight from guilt in psychoanalysis itself. Freud and his followers had illuminated the ways in which we are often the unwitting agents of our suffering, unconsciously contriving to refine and perpetuate our childhood pain, clutching defeat from the jaws of victory, fearing success, being wrecked by success, committing crimes in order to be caught and punished, finding partners to punish so we need not do it ourselves, addictions to destructive substances, activities, and people, developing painful hysterical and psychosomatic conditions largely due to our unconscious guilt and the need for punishment for real and imagined sins or crimes. But by the late 1960s, Herbert Marcuse claimed that the Freudian conception of the structured and conflicted human psyche had become obsolescent in the social reality due to social changes producing the unstructured personality that Christopher Lash referred to as the narcissistic personality of our time. According to Cohut, 1978, guilty man had been replaced in our culture by tragic man who suffers not from guilt inflicted by a harsh superego, but from shame and the fragmentation and emptiness of the self arising from inadequate provision in infancy and childhood by the early self-object environment. Over time, the classical psychology of conflict and compromise formation came increasingly to be superseded 
by a discourse of victimization at the hands of not good enough mothers, absent authoritarian or abusive fathers, and other varieties of parental and societal failure. Now, of course, there is no denying the reality of trauma, abuse, exploitation, and injustice. But I think what has been lost sight of in some of the revisionist perspectives, such as self-psychology, uh, is that trauma induces rage, mostly turned against the self. If we find a crater, we might suspect a bomb. Several classic westerns open upon a scene of death and devastation, the wagon train overturned and on fire, one wheel festooned with arrows slowly turning. We see the results of an attack, but not the violence itself. Rather than emptiness directly reflecting inadequate provision, it is also a result of reactive aggression, fueling what Wilfred Bion called the ego-destructive superego. It is for this reason that a simple therapy through provision of what Kohut referred to as self-object function and Howard Bacall called optimal responsiveness is, although a necessary element of therapeutic technique, ultimately insufficient because it fails to address the key pathogen, the ego-destructive superego, that generates the rage or persecutory states that characterize the disordered self. While shame is a manifestation of the self-preoccupation that characterizes the culture of narcissism, depressive or reparative, as distinct from persecutory guilt, is not. For mature guilt involves moving beyond the realm of self-obsession, the paranoid schizoid position, into the field of recognition and concern for the other, the depressive or reparative position. In several streams of psychoanalytic thought, the central role of guilt evasion in pathological narcissism was obscured, an instance of what Russell, Russell Jacoby uh, referred to as the social amnesia in which society remembers less and less, faster and faster, and in which the sign of the times is thought that has succumbed to fashion. I mean, in recent years, I guess I've become more and more convinced that, <laughs> I mean, I've explored all of the new perspectives, um, intersubjectivity, Stolaro, Branshaft, all of self-psychology, Mitchell, all of the relational analysts. Uh, I've read all of this stuff but maybe it's a function of aging, but I come back to the point where I consider the real gold of psychoanalysis uh, to be its insights into unconscious guilt and self-punishment, self-limitation, self-sabotage. It seems to me, in case after case, young people, older people, I mean, it takes different forms. It's covered by various layers that have to be gotten through before we get down to this, but this seems to me increasingly to be at the core. But while guilt and the superego are evaded in both the culture of narcissism and the psychoanalysis reflecting it, today we witness both the evasion and the hypertrophy of the superego. Both amoral narcissism on the one hand and moral outrage and righteous indignation on the other among the many strategies of guilt evasion, uh, including the preference for persecutory guilt and shame 
as a defense against persecutory guilt, concern, and reparation. Okay, I wrote a paper a number of years ago called Self-Punishment as Guilt Evasion. Freud equated self-punishment and guilt. Uh, and I, I think he therefore failed to see that self-punishment can itself serve as a tremendous defense. And it's always amazed me that uh, many people are prepared <laughs> to live lives of orgies of self-persecution rather than acknowledge that they're bad <laughs> as well as good, that they, that they have committed crimes and are guilty. This cannot be faced. People often prefer lives of self-torture to actually moving into the depressive reparative position in that way. Um, okay, uh, so among the many defenses against guilt is that in which we inflict guilt upon or induce it in others and manifest what Racker called a mania for reproaching. While many evade the superego in one way or another, some do so by embracing and identifying with it and marching under the banner of the superego, they target the wrongdoers who become their scapegoats. Psychoanalysis has long understood this scapegoating practice, but um, this hypertrophy of the superego and this mania for reproaching others. Uh, I think we see this all over the place these days. Ironically, libertarian forces pushing for deregulation on the right have been joined by forces on what I think of as the pseudo-left. It really annoys me <laughs> when many people think of the left these days as identity politics. Um, the left used to be a critique of capitalism. Uh, in any case, um, yeah, have been joined, people on the right have been joined by people on the left, the pseudo-left, uh, whose attack on regulation has taken the form not only of demands to defund the police, but also to cancel the careers of suspected wrongdoers, often ignoring due process and targeting any authority that would presume to defend legally permissible free speech. Just as the unconscious, just as the unscrupulous narcissist ignores or repudiates limits, so law enforcement, democratic principles and processes, and even the law itself are floated on both the pseudo-left and the right, and even in the highest offices of the land. A major reason for our moral confusion in both society and psychoanalysis, is the failure to recognize the existence of a conscience apart from the moralistic superego. Eli Sagan um, really identified this very clearly in his 1984 or 1988 book, Freud, Women and Morality. I picked it up from him. Uh, but uh, it turns out that this distinction <laughs> is, is um, rooted in theology and in the New Testament. This is the distinction between the law and the gospel. This is the distinction between Moses and Christ. Um, um, I, I talk about this a lot in my 2013 book, um, but uh, Sagan really is the one who brought it to my attention. Taught to maintain neutrality. Oh, by the way, Carl Jung understood this. I've never been a great fan of Carl Jung, but in 1958, he wrote a wonderful essay called A Psychological View of Conscience, in which he clearly nails the distinction between the socially constructed superego and the conscience, which he believes has an archetypal basis, by which he means natural. 
Uh, and of course, like Jung, I see conscience as rooted in our primate nature, as biological roots. Um, taught to maintain neutrality and refrain from being judgmental or super egoish with patience, without a concept of a conscience distinct from superego, either a separate mental structure or a pro-social as distinct from the antisocial part of the id, theory succumbs to the colonization of morality by the superego and clinicians fall victim to moral relativism. Without a conscience, separate from the superego, we have no judge to judge the judge. If with James Strachey, we feel the patient's superego ought to be modified, we lack any principled basis for determining in what direction. I mean, mainstream psychoanalysis still prefers to go with Strachey and talk about superego modification, but no one seems to raise the question, how do we know in which direction it should be modified? Where does that come from? Without the distinction between the superego and conscience, authoritative demands or mandates, such as for vaccination for COVID-19, may become unconscionably authoritarian. Uh, I have to confess that I myself got swept up in that moral panic. I shake my head uh, at the degree to which I got caught up in it. Uh, I'm vaccinated. <coughs> I'm, vac I'm vaccinated five times, but uh, we got pretty authoritarian. Uh, we were blocking the analytic training of a number of our colleagues, or our candidates, who were unable or refused to become vaccinated. Um, it's very easy to get caught up in this thing. Um, woke liberals rightly deploring racism, sexism, heterosexism, etc., May, may not only themselves succumb to authoritarianism in their opposition to these social evils, uh, but find themselves paralyzed in the face of less subtle authoritarians who, while marching under the same banner, anti-racism, etc., attack free speech, due process, or the law itself. Liberal authorities frequently become impotent in this situation, not only because of their own disavowed authoritarianism, but because they know no higher moral principle, conscience, from which to call out the extremists. It is well to recall in this connection that memorable moment when Joe McCarthy's superegoic attacks on the left were denounced as unconscionable by Joseph Welch. I'm yeah. quoting, quoting here from the U.S. Senate Archive, June 9, 1954, quotes, Let us not assassinate this lad further, Senator. You have done enough. Have you no sense of decency? I think I was about 10 when I watched that on TV. I was impressed then, and I'm even more impressed now. Although Eric Fromm in 1950, Carl Jung in 1958, Neville Symington in 1998, they all tended to differentiate conscience from the superego, mainstream psychoanalysis continues to conflate them. Freud himself did not differentiate persecutory guilt and shame inflicted by the superego from the reparative guilt or concern mediated by conscience. Uh, these were subsequently sorted out by Melanie Klein, Leon Grinberg, and Donald Winnicott in deploring the buildup of guilt in civilization, Freud in Civilization and Its Discontents, had only punitive guilt in mind 
failing to recognize that while in civilization we need less persecutory paranoid schizoid guilt, we need much more reparative depressive position guilt and concern. Beyond this confusion as to the nature of guilt, in psychoanalysis, social science, and society in general, there is widespread confusion regarding the nature of evil. Freud himself mistakenly blamed it on the, quotes, beast in man, when human destructiveness clearly derives not primarily from our animal inheritance, but from our uniquely human, human symbolic functioning, that is, the superego ideologies that motivate and the ego functions that implement mass destruction. Except for the seriously psychopathic, in order to act, most people have to convince themselves that what they are about to do is, for the most part, good or at least harmless. In order to feel guilt, evildoers first have to change their minds about what they have done, seeing it not as good, but as wrong, bad, or evil. With, without such a revised definition of the situation, People are unable to feel guilt, remorse, regret, or contrition, and hence unable to repent, seek to make reparation, and mourn their destructiveness. In seeking to understand evil, Kennedy, in 2023, emphasizes the role of what he calls an evil moral climate, or an evil imagination. He points out that people in early modern England seriously believed that the civilizing mission was a moral obligation and that it was good to bring people from a state of barbarism to a civilized way of life, unquote. In his study of the Nazi doctors, Robert Lifton found that they were, for the most part, not psychopaths, well, but dedicated physicians working hard to root out the cancer that in their racist ideology they associated with the Jews. Because in psychoanalysis we've associated the antisocial with the id and the pro-social with the superego, it has been difficult for us to see evil as superego driven, or goodness as arising from the id. The point I want to emphasize is that uh, the greater part of human evil is done by do-gooders, uh, those who uh, planned and carried out the atomic bombing of Hiroshima and Nagasaki were not psychopaths but people who believed in the righteousness of their cause, as were those who flew airplanes into the World Trade Center. Most evildoers have good intentions. While the superego sometimes defends against barbarism, as Freud thought, at least in his sociological, if not in his clinical writings, it frequently encourages and gives barbarism its blessing. But not all of the guilt from which we suffer is our own. Some is, in Freud's misleading term, borrowed from others who, as my colleague Joe Fernando explains, these others who, uh, these people induce in others the guilt they themselves find unbearable. But in this connection, we have failed to notice the obvious. The child did not ask to borrow the guilt and, but it was, that was induced. 
uh, nor does the parent want it back. The child did not ask to borrow it, nor does the parent want it back. Uh, the induction of guilt and feelings of inadequacy and inferiority through projective identification is at the core of the master-slave dialectic. It needs to be remembered that it works both ways. Former victims may enjoy revenge by inducing guilt in those they identify with their former exploiters. In addition to the patterns of self-damage that Freud called moral masochism that entail the deployment of reactive aggression against the self, there is the moral sadism in which such rage is discharged against others who are substituted for the self as the target of the sadistic superego. In order to escape its attacks, some identify with the aggressor and inflict punishment as a way of avoiding it, like those death camp prisoners, the Kapos, who became the assistants of the guards, or like hostages who identify with their captors, as in so-called Stockholm Syndrome. In these ways, a critical superego is embraced and self-persecution is escaped by targeting others. If one marches under the banner of the superego, fo focusing attention on the abusers and identifying with victims, one's righteousness may for a time be enhanced and one's moral defects obscured until, that is, someone has the courage to accuse the accusers. In Man Against Himself, Carl Menninger, in 1938, documented the range of guilt substitutes and suicide equivalence. I find those concepts very useful. Guilt equivalence and suicide equivalence through which we unconsciously torture ourselves and unknowingly practice what I view as a type of archaic sacrificial religion. Just as an animal caught in a trap may chew off its leg to survive, so we placate the savage god Freud and his followers called the superego, seeking to escape with our lives by sacrificing our careers, our marriages, our health. In my view, unconscious guilt and the unconscious need for punishment motivate myriad forms of self-sabotage and self-destructiveness in people whose chosen guilt substitutes allow them to have no clue that they suffer from guilt. Freud put this very well in 1923. Quotes, In the end, we come to see that we are dealing with what may be called a moral factor, which is finding its satisfaction in the illness and refuses to give up the punishment of suffering. But as far as the patient is concerned, this sense of guilt is dumb. It does not tell him he is guilty. He does not feel guilty. He feels ill. Point couldn't be better put than that. <clears throat> As early as, the, as, as 1950, Eric Erickson wrote that whereas in the past patients thought they knew who they were and who they ought to be, but came to therapy because they were having trouble being it, the modern patient doesn't know who he is or who he ought to be. Many of our patients 
come feeling ill or empty, not guilty. But for the psychoanalyst, as for the courtroom judge, a person's claim that he is not guilty is the beginning, not the end of an inquiry. Evidence must be marshaled and critically reviewed. In fact, it is my thesis that tragic man and guilty man are not fundamentally different disorders at all, for progress in therapy generally reveals that underneath the manifest emptiness of the former lies the self-directed aggression of the latter. Erickson's modern patient, who doesn't know who he is or ought to be, Kohut's tragic man and Marcuse's unstructured personality, had been prefigured decades earlier in the literature of existentialism, perhaps most clearly in Albert Camus' L'Etranger. When his mother dies, or he's having sex with a woman who wants him to tell her he loves her, or he shoots a stranger on the beach, or prior to his execution a priest offers to hear his confession, Merceau feels nothing and remains indifferent. Many contemporary psychoanalysts seem no longer able to see or hear, let alone speak, to the unconscious guilt lurking behind and driving this behavior. However empty, bored, and indifferent he is, Merceau nevertheless manages both to kill and get himself killed. I can well imagine having Merceau on my analytic couch and witnessing the gradual emergence of the rage and then the shame and then the guilt and then the tears underlying his manifest indifference. Merceau is a frozen man in need of therapeutic thawing. The emptiness and fragmentation of the self are brought about precisely by the persecutory and annihilating superego. Of course, this is not merely the Freudian superego formed at the end of the Oedipal phase at five or six years of age, but the pregenital superego formed in the first year of life as an internalization and identification with the bad persecutory breast, as Melanie Klein taught us, an annihilating part object that lies beneath and at the core of the later Oedipal development. Over the last decade or so in psychoanalysis, issues concerning the superego guilt and conscience have to some extent returned from repression. Around the time of the Occupy movement and the emergence of whistleblowers like Assange, Manning and Snowden, psychoanalytic books and articles began to appear with titles like You Ought To, A Psychoanalytic Study of the Superego and Conscience, Barnett, 2007, Guilt and Its Vicissitudes, Psychoanalytic Reflections on Guilt by Hughes, 2008, The Quest for Conscience and the Birth of the Mind, Reiner, 2009, The Still Small Voice, my book in 2013, uh, my colleague Elio Frateroli uh, in Philadelphia, Reflections on the Absence of Morality in Psychoanalytic Theory, that was 2013, and Salman Oktar edited Guilt, Origins, Manifestations, and um, Management in 2013. No doubt this partial comeback was a reflection in psychoanalysis of a dawning recognition that the culture of narcissism had gotten us into hot water. What Leo Rangel, back in 1980, now he never got caught up in this flight from guilt, uh, very astute. Uh, in 1980, he writes The Mind of Watergate, 
about Nixon and Halderman and all of those people around, around Nixon, Nixon, the mind of Watergate, he refers to what was possessing them as the syndrome of the compromise of integrity. Uh, in mental conflict, defenses may be directed against the id, as in neurosis, but also against the ego, the superego, and the conscience, that is, against the regulatory functions of the mind, leading to those forms of psychic deregulation we call narcissistic and, in extreme, psychopathic. One of the most effective defenses against the guilt-generating superego involves embracing and unleashing it, sometimes violently, against targeted others, but also in, in, in those that we call normopathic, Joyce McDougall, Bolus, normotic illness, the pathologically normal, um, they often make do with um, a, a quieter forms of disdain and uh, disapproval. Uh, and there are righteous conservatives who seem to take for granted their divine right to rule. Uh, they often manage to induce in any opponents the feeling that they are being naughty children. I could tell you a story about <laughs> many months in which some of my conservative colleagues made me feel for a time like a naughty child because I was challenging one of their cherished rules until finally they angered me enough to call the vote and my side won, at least on that occasion. But I was paralyzed because these colleagues had stimulated my archaic superego. And also I was afraid that they might die in the room. You know, They might have heart attacks or strokes if they lost the vote. They did walk out ashen-faced. Um, but I was hampered in my ability to act by this induction of the inhibiting superego. Um, those identified with authority often succeed in crippling any opposition by evoking in opponents through projective identification, the archaic inhibiting superego. Psychoanalysis originally opposed repression and censorship. It sought to make the unconscious conscious and emancipate people through free speech, free association, from inhibition, symptoms, and anxiety, putting everything into words. It suspended moral judgment in order to bring socially unacceptable elements of the soul, infantile and polymorphous perverse sexuality and aggression, into the light. While we have rightfully sought to overcome our racism, sexism, heterosexism, classism, and other uh, socially structured patterns of injustice, today, in the face of a new Puritanism, it might well be difficult, even impossible, in some psychoanalytic circles to teach Freud on sexuality, let alone Robert Stoller and Otto Kernberg, who argue that sexuality has to be to a degree transgressive, that is, naughty, in order to be worth having. Such Puritanism, this mania for reproaching, and its uh, related authoritarianism, uh, constitutes an increasingly widespread social pathology that is spreading like a virus, especially in the humanities and social science faculties of universities, with the contagion <clears throat> spreading even into psychoanalytic societies. Uh, a young psychologist uh, was asked to teach at a prominent, she was asked to teach psychodynamics in the summer course at a prominent university, and the students expected her only to bash Freud. She refused to bash Freud entirely. She was critical. There was plenty to criticize. She was willing to criticize, but she wasn't w willing to sweepingly bash Freud. And she overheard them in the uh, cafeteria talking about how they were going to punish her. And quite rightly, she was frightened and she packed up and got out of town, quit her job and left. Uh, this is not so untypical, at least uh, in America. <laughs> 
my son, uh, who is a candidate in psychoanalytic training here, um, but he was also doing his PhD in social work, and his university invited, oh. invited Jordan Peterson. I'm not a big fan of Jordan, but anyway, they invited Jordan Peterson to speak. And my son is not a fan of Jordan exactly either, but um, he decided he wanted to hear him. And to his shock, when he got there, uh, a bunch of people were with megaphones were shouting Jordan down, denying his capacity to speak at the university he was invited to speak at. But to my son's horror, guess who was um, leading the pack? His PhD supervisor. <laughs> Uh huh. Anyway, unfortunately, Freud's blurring of the distinction between superego and conscience has impaired psychoanalysts' capacity to recognize and avoid infection. In this area, psychoanalysis is as vulnerable as the general public to abusive behavior enacted under the banner of the superego. Psychoanalysts should, of all people, remember that you can't tell a book by its cover. Beneath what appears to be an admirable concern for justice may lie, as Nietzsche, among others, taught us, a destructive will to power and revenge motivated by envy, resentment, and other forms of malice that need to be called out and opposed by people of conscience. Both tragic man and the new authoritarians are unaware of their guilt, in the one case through its repression, in the other through its projection. There are many ways, and in conclusion, let me just say that there are many ways to define the goal of clinical psychoanalysis. But developing a conscience capable of both bearing mature guilt and standing up to the sadistic superego, neither embracing nor capitulating to it, should be added to our list. Thank you. Thank you, Don. Thank you very much indeed for a wide-ranging and very uh, important paper, in my view. Um, it moves right into the therapy room, I think, and that um, psychoanalysis is about questioning things, uh, like I hope the Q&A from tonight will, will show. Um, it's about questioning things, but more and more and more I'm experiencing in the consulting room the idea that therapy, at least therapy, should be about positive affirmation all the time. They affirm people's opinions and their identities rather than look at it, rather than question it analytically. You know? Definitely. And, uh, uh, that, that's uh, something we're having to deal with all the time. Okay, I'll just throw it open to questions. Um, people put their hands up, um, you know, to go to reactions. Everybody knows what to do by now after all this. Uh, just put your hand up and wave, raise a hand and ask a question. Feel free to just join in, you know. Uh, can, I just, can I just say, in, 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 if, uh, David, uh, that to your point about how we're encouraged to simply validate um, yeah. I, I'm, I've, um, because I'm so old, they can't do anything much to me anymore anyway. So I've, got, uh, I, I, <laughs> I've gotten bolder. And to my surprise, patients that I thought would not be able to take direct, blunt confrontations, yeah. they're often able to take it. They often feel relief. Yes, yes. But our younger colleagues are terrified to do it. Yeah. Yeah, I think so, because I've identified with more with the youth culture and everything. But uh, you know, t taking up the, the idea that you, the analysts, are going to be an authoritarian and, and not do an analysis, just have the, have you're the one that has these rather fixed ideas to begin with, and invite an exploration of that seems to break, seems to encourage something else to develop. You know? Right. Um, I've got lots of questions myself, but, but I'll throw it open for everybody first um, to uh, raise your hand, everybody. Okay, Roger, Roger Hartley, as for kicking off, uh, put your uh, sound on. That's it. Can you hear me? Yeah. Hi, Roger. You can. Good. Hello. Hi. Uh, no, thank you. That's a really interesting um, um, paper. Um, in a sense, it, this is you know more of a comment, perhaps, than a question. But it it it, it seems to me that. Um, 
uh, uh, that Freud and, and Melanie Klein had different views of psychic reality and that Klein took psychic reality in almost a literal sense. Um, and for Freud, it was much more uh, a reaction to something that had never happened in the first place. Um, and the difference between those two attitudes is quite considerable when you come to, you know, the consultant room, I think, what might happen in the consultant room. Because if you, you know, if you're confronted with the concreteness of something, you know, in, a, in psychic life, then that is quite different, as it were, to try to unpick something that never actually happened. And the fact that it never actually happened um, has a lot to do with, as, as it were, um, you know, ameliorating the guilt. Uh, th th there may not be such a lot of difference in practice, perhaps, I don't know about that, but there's a very big difference yeah. in terms of the view of the mind. Mm -hmm. uh, perhaps uh, I blur that difference because you know people ask me what my orientation is, and I guess I've started calling myself some years ago a Kleinian Freudian. Uh, I think it was Roy Schaefer who did that little book on the new Freudians of uh, the new Kleinians of London, and and he was calling them Kleinian Freudians, Freudians who chose to follow the Kleinian development, and. Um, I guess I, I see the idea of pH fantasy, unconscious fantasy, as central to the Kleinian vision yeah. of the mind. I think the mind is a fantasy system, a system of fantasies, and it seems to me that what I'm doing clinically is trying to help people become conscious of the fantasies that have um, possessed them. If I can borrow a, a term from demonic possession, it's like we are possessed by our fantasies, we don't know that they're fantasies, we take them quite literally. Um, on the other hand, um, some of these fantasies have taken possession of us entirely uh, because real things have sometimes happened, which have just nailed us to the fantasy. I'm, I'm thinking of uh, a yes. patient who had deep, early, early hatred for his mother but when hunting with uh, his father and his uncle, he, they'd been teasing him because he hadn't bagged a bird in some time and he was too eager. He saw something moving, he shot, it was his dog. He had to watch his uncle put a bullet in his beloved dog's head and therefore he was a killer. I mean, he was already feeling like a killer because he wanted to kill his mother. But now he was nailed to that fantasy. Um, so I think these two things come together in very complicated ways. That killing of the dog was a real thing. Uh, yes, yeah, quite, quite. Yeah. yeah. That's very real. His, hunt, his father was taking a hunting to shoot animals. The shooting of his own dog made a reality out of what he was doing. So. Absolutely. But if I could just follow that, I mean, if you were yeah. to ex extend, you know, that example from something incidental in someone's, as, as it were, in a personal life, and extend it to something social and political, mm. collective, you know, historical situation, then, after all, there are many ways in which you can approach and under understand that situation um, without feeling you're getting involved, getting involved in it, it uh, through fantasy. It, you know, because there's too much... <clears throat> you know, collective stuff, which you might want to call rational. Mm -hmm. So, I mean, you, 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 I don't know if, if, if that makes any well, sense. Well, take climate, take, it, take the climate yeah. catastrophe, okay? Yes. Um, obviously, if we listen to the scientists, we're damn scared uh, yes. about what's coming down the pipe uh, for us and for our children. I mean, I'll probably be gone before it gets too much worse, but uh, I worry about my son, of course, so there's a reality to this, but um, that should not obscure us from 
uh, our unconscious guilt in the way Melanie Klein explains, we've been, we, we, we've been emptying out our mother. We've been attacking our mother, mother, mother earth. Um, I think we're full of guilt, unconscious guilt. The evidence of what we have been doing to her is all over the place. So we both have a reality-based concern and we have this confusion of nature with mother nature. Yeah. I think you have to, I have to, I guess I'm trying to say we have to work both sides of this at the same yeah, time. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. And I mean, yeah. you were saying that in a sense with, you know, the, the conscience, superego distinction in a way, because conscience is something from normal life, as it were. Yeah, I would say it's something from animal life. I mean, yes. uh, we inherit this from our primate cousins. And, um, well, the infant oh. research also is showing how little kids of three to six months of age already have an intrinsic sense of right from wrong. Yeah. I mean, I was trained originally as a sociologist, uh, and, and the sociologists think this is all a social construction, internalized. I mean, any, any reference to, to biological factors is anathema. Uh, in, in sociological circles, for the most part, or at least it used to be. I think a, a sociologist not too long ago wrote a paper called Why Are Sociologists Nature Phobes? Thank you, Matt. That's really interesting. Thank you. Thank you. Rob, oh, Rob, Rob, come in. All right. Thank you. Um, thanks for that, Don. Um, I'm up before the judge next month for my part in an environmental um, protest, I guess you could say. Okay. So I was very um, intrigued by your comment, who judges the judge? Yeah. And it does strike me through my experiences so far that there is a um, very clear distinction between what, uh, what I would call um, a conscience and the law as it exists. Yes. So going through the court processes, everything's about the law. But it's actually the way they've manipulated things is they've done everything within their powers to eliminate the conscience. Right. And that makes it very, very difficult for someone in my position to defend myself. Absolutely. So what you said resonates with me. Good. But what I wanted to add was I think I'm, I'm somebody that does feel a lot of guilt over what I've done and over many things I've done. Um, but it's very difficult for me to now separate out the guilt that I feel intrinsically from the guilt that I feel is being projected onto me by society. Yes. And also the shame that's being projected onto me by society, yes. by the media. Yeah. Yes. Um, so there is something I think about having a strong internal core, a sense of resilience. Um, but I, I think it's worth bearing in mind the difference between individual, group and society and the planet, if we want to think about another layer on top, um, actions that may uh, seem immoral with regards to uh, inter-individual relations may be necessary in terms of social or environmental survival. Yeah. yeah. Yes. But it's very, very difficult. So it's hard to actually escape any kind of guilt. I think, you know, you're damned if you do and damned if you don't sometimes. But I just, I'd be interested to hear your thoughts on some of Yeah. Things. Well, you're reminding me of the, uh, the, the big uh, debate, as it were, between Jean-Paul Sartre and, and Albert Camus many, many years ago. I mean, uh, Sartre's attitude towards Camus' humanism and his liberalism was that it's all very well to... Um, want to have nothing to do with violence and wanting to seek political purity and so on and so forth. But but uh, sometimes uh, the more you refrain from, uh, from action, the more blood there will be in the long run. Um, uh, so I always lean towards Sartre on that. But at the same time, um, Look, I mean, as a young man, I, I was a Trotskyist for quite a while. And 
Then I got pretty disillusioned with the trots because they were so manipulative. Behind the scenes, they'd be controlling the committee to end the war in Vietnam. Among the other students, they'd be staging the meeting, they'd be manipulating. Uh, I left that and um, went into a kind of anarchism. I accepted Bakunin's critique of Marx, um, and I fell in love with Noam Chomsky. Um, um, but, but it was reading... It was reading the great biography of Trotsky, the prophet armed, the prophet disarmed, and the prophet betrayed. One of the great biographies in the English language by uh, Isaac Deutscher. And in the court, and he was a Trotskyist uh, at the beginning. But in the course of this book, you can see a, a whole developing critique of revolutionary politics on the part of Deutscher. Uh, you know, I mean, Trotsky himself was originally a Menshevik, not a Bolshevik, and he had a critique of Bolshevism. He said the trouble is that the, the party comes to stand for the proletariat, but pretty soon the Central Committee comes to stand for the party, and then pretty soon the Fuhrer, the leader, comes to stand for everything. But then he dropped all of that, and he joined Lenin, and he became a Marxist-Leninist, you know. Uh, Deutscher said that in order to, to make a revolution, you have to pick up guns, and you have to enter the paranoid schizoid position because we know most soldiers can't pull the trigger. To be able to pull the trigger, you have to leave the depressive reparative position. And, and in order to get the revolution done, you have to do this. Now, do you think that having done that after the revolution, you're going to be able to emerge again into the depressive reparative and become all democratic? No. You know, the winners of the revolution are going to be the new authoritarians. So I've had to distance myself entirely from revolutionary politics. I'm way left of Bernie Sanders, but I'm still a democratic socialist, you know. And, um, and I fully empathize with the impulses towards extremes and violence. Uh, I understand, but... I mean, if we go that way, it feels to me we're doomed. That's my short answer. <laughs> but look, uh, I wanted to also Rob, say... Rob, I mean, Robin, you need to respond to that. Oh, yeah. <laughs> yeah, but it's, that's, that's, that's the catch-22, isn't it? If we don't go that way, we seem equally doomed. Yeah. Yes. I, I guess that's not just in the case with environmental uh, politics, but also with any of the social issues. When people becoming hardline on racism and sexism and all the rest, you know, it's for very good reason, because we've had enough of this. It's been going on for years, so everything's laced with power. Yeah. Everything's power relations, and, you know, I think, yeah, people are coming across as rude now, but we don't really have that many means at our disposals with which to fight back. So, um, and also, on the, you know, we're, we're, we're getting a bad rep from the media, yeah. you know? which distorts everything uh, well i wanted to say the internet has really transformed the way that we relate right mm, sorry but I, I just wanted to say that you know you talked about the trouble you have guilt like every human being has guilt uh, uh for, from many different sources but and then there's the guilt that's induced mm. in you by the media and by the establishment and whatever um this is a time to have a good psychoanalyst that you see four times a week. Someone you trust who can try to help you sort out what's coming from superego and what's coming from conscience. I mean, for four months, I was in this battle and I knew I had the votes to win that vote, but I couldn't call the vote. Uh, my superego was just having a field day with me. And, and um, I, it made me so uncertain that what I thought, maybe what I thought was conscience wasn't. Maybe it was ambitious. Maybe it was death wishes towards these senior colleagues. Uh, maybe it was some sort of triumph. Maybe it was sheer narcissism. <laughs> <laughs> sure, I get all that. Yeah. <laughs> thank you, thank you. Okay, thank you. Put your hands up, people. Um, Ross, Ross, Charnock, welcome. Yeah, uh, thanks very much. Uh, to be honest, I think some of the things I wanted to talk about have been covered um, but just in the last uh, discussion. I mean, good luck to you, Robert. Um, yeah, absolutely. Yeah. It's, it's strange. As a, there's recently my union, I was trying to approach somebody I was told might want to be involved in a, actually in a separate union in a 
as a, a mental health social sort of social worker mental health he, he's in court and there's a, a guy called sean who, who's in manchester who's uh, in exile and just stopped oil so it's 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 formidable really the, the sacrifices and then also people in universities which i think is even more brave in many ways where somebody i know who they've been uh, in the, the hiding in the uh, the roof of manchester university because they've had the audacity to charge them money you know and and then the university just gets very black and white about well you know you've you, we are adamant that you've broken the law or you've transgressed our rules and uh, and really, you know, it's an absolute racket what's going on in education. Nobody in education likes it. And then in the tabby stock, you sorry to, you know, yeah, but, but yeah you, you, you do bring it, do bring it up. I was going to good. But but you've got the worst mix of everything where you've got this sort of weird NHS internal market sort of business model thing. And then you've had, got added into that tabby stock, you know, once people get on these courses through merit and it gets very muddled, you know, you don't know whether when you're complaining on about things, whether you're a uh, 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 an example of an annoying consumerist capitalist uh, me 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 I'm the I'm the consumer give me what I want or I'm uh, acting as a trade union so you know my, my yeah. rights are being transgressed here it gets very confusing and and I think a lot of all of this is is really what I, I mean I re- really agreed with you know you know pretty much everything that the positions you're coming from and I, I really found it helpful you. Don when you, you clarified your, your sort of political journey if you like which I think a bit like a, a depressive position I'm sort of moving in and out. I've, I've recently joined a Trotskyite <laughs> okay. organisation you can still be in the Labour Party but that's a different story anyway it's mm. an offshoot of the SWP so you know it's called Counterfire and they do have good positions They're, they get to conference they say brave things they have a very nuanced well, position they've moved on the on. transition they're not the way they were back in the 1960s when I was with them. I'm sure they've evolved in lots of ways too. Well, no, some of them haven't anyway. Ah. Not some of them exactly the same. They're still putting the, the, the party first or the sectarian elements to it first. But, but everything you're saying covers it. It's, as you were talking, I was thinking, wow, yeah, when, you know, when everything I'm doing for the greater good is still born of guilt and narcissism, absolutely, and wanting to be admired as people are probably gathering now as I'm speaking, you know, but, but the point the point I'm getting at, really, really the other point I want to move on to is more about what I always get confused about is I always feel like I make the same point when I come to these. I get very confused about, am I just missing the point? Have I missed the memo that we're just giving a psychoanalytic interpretation of... Uh, something and using politics and that's what we're here for you know we're not literally marxist whereas i think still kind of think yeah 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 but 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 we kind of have to be i, I sort of still feel this sociological and a biological idea is still kind of liberalism based on where we are you know the biological oppression of women predates capitalism but my god mm-hmm. capitalism has made it worse and i think my I, I'm not a critique of Freud in any sort of more, any kind of what what might be considered woke terms, but I do wonder if we take for granted what is innate about human nature. It's almost like it becomes like human nature. Uh, uh, you, you, That's you always know, the get... danger. That's always the danger yeah. with the concept of human nature. But I'm very influenced by the great Marxist sociologist Eric psychoanalyst Eric Fromm. Yeah. Eric Fromm points out that Marx himself believed in a human nature. He distinguished human nature yeah. in general from human nature as it manifests under particular socio-historical conditions. But he never yeah. threw out the concept of human nature. And of course, Fromm takes that concept and talks about universal human needs, which gives him um, a way of measuring how well or poorly particular societies gratify or violate those those human needs um so but there is always the danger of mistaking a particular social formation and universalizing it and rationalizing it and, and essentializing it that, that's a real that's a real problem yeah I, I suppose my question is more of almost this idea of the threat if you like the existential threat to psychoanalytic thought i mean i don't understand enough about it i'm still you know, a trainee uh, on the D59, I'm still, you know, going through therapy. I mean, of course, everyone's moving in and there's never an end point. But but I do want, I am an optimist. You know, I do believe in that Marxist idea that, you know, almost sort of psychically, um, it's, 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 it's the outside in rather than the inside out. And I wonder what, what happens to all these ideas of psychoanalysis if, if we, you know, it's not called the struggle for nothing, but if we succeed, you know, 
and people might do some uh, some blood might be shed or the you know the greater good all these philosophical ideas but say we get to a more a point where things are better a bit like you know when we had a, a brief bit of keynesian economics in the 60s and then it all went neoliberal where there was possibilities i mean yeah. i believe it i'm not you know but i do believe in that music was better things were you know not everything was better but there was a real um something was being worked through if you like and yeah. if we got to if we won because we're either going to 50 50 we're either going to not win the planet's going to end or you know for me something like revolution there's no alternative because we can't go back to we can't regulate because of the, the things people are saying imperial uh, capitalism has become um, move through these stages that we it's, there's no conditions by which we can legislate it has to come from outside of these systems so if we get to this more point where we become you know these 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 utopian ideas of what a socialist world could be for art creativity consciousness all these positive what then happens to the more um cynical ideas for want of a better word of human nature that, that we study well, maybe <laughs> the cynical ideas uh, are wrong ideas, uh, and and if there is a uh, if there is a rebirth or a resurrection, um, then those ideas are pushed aside. I mean, um, look, I I think in in all psychoanalytic um, traditions, there is some belief in the possibility of uh, well. Kohut called it the restoration of the self. Uh, others might call it the revival of the true self or the resurrection of the true self. I mean, um, I think that's what all clinicians are working for or should be working for. Uh, we, 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 we can't, we don't have a magic wand to make it happen, but, but if we provide an atmosphere of safety and trust and and empathy and intelligence and intervention, including confrontation. I mean, we can, analysts are reluctant to provoke. We're all about containing, <laughs> but part of our job is provoking, stirring the pot. You know, if we're doing our job well, we do that too. But what we're, we're trying to promote a rebirth. I mean, look, I'm a secret kind of Christian. And um, so there is Christianity informing some of my optimism and my hopefulness. I've seen I've seen the dead, metaphorically speaking, resurrected. I've seen alcoholics who are on a hopeless path of self-destruction stop drinking and turn their lives around and create order where there was chaos before. That's the work I want to do. Um, now, I'm speaking on the individual level. It's perhaps in some ways easier to, to do that, working with with lost individuals, lost souls, helping them recover their soul. I mean, some of these people, the lights have gone out of their eyes. I mean, but sometimes the lights come back on again. I mean, I've seen people who have had psychotic breaks and the lights have gone out. There's no music, there's no... There's, but, then, but then, under the right conditions, life can, can emerge again, you know? Um, that's a therapeutic uh, task. If you try to apply that to whole societies or the world at large, it becomes, how do you do that, you know? I mean, I, I don't have the answer. I just work away in my little consulting area with individuals, hoping that somehow it adds up. And sometimes it does, because if that alcoholic man gets himself together, look at the effects that that has on his kids. It does spread out. Yeah. It has to be both, I suppose, yeah. Yeah. Don, I'm surprised when you said you're a secret Christian because one of my old friends who died a, quite a while ago now, Joel Covell, um, oh. who, who probably knew, uh, you know, as a psychoanalyst Marxist at the end of his life, decided he became a Christian. And it was just quite a shift, you know, and, and it was very shocking to me at the time. And uh, I almost found it almost impossible to forgive him. But <laughs> <laughs> there have been there have been a few. I mean, Stanley Levy, at, he had to retire before he wrote a book indicating that he had been a lifelong Anglo-Catholic. Um, um, I'm, I'm not exactly, I don't think too much of the church. I'm kind of a Kierkegaardian uh, Christian. I mean, he spent uh, most of his time damning the church, you know, uh, sometimes people call people like me a secular Christian. 
And I'm a secular Christian, except when I'm going for surgery. Then sure. I'm not secular anymore. <laughs> then it becomes fully no magical. Atheists, no, no atheists in the trenches. I exactly, agree. exactly. Yes. Do you think identity politics is really just another, another, an opium of the people to some extent? It's a way of distracting oneself from the bigger questions of society. I think addressed. the ruling... Climate change, like Rob Stewart is talking about climate change, is so enormous and terrifying. Yes, know? I think the ruling class sit around in their clubs laughing. Uh, f look at these idiots going on and on about identity politics and they stop talking. I remember, how many years ago was the Occupy movement? They were talking about the 1% and the 99%. That was all yeah. about capitalism. It was like, what, yeah. 10 years ago, 15 years ago? What happened? Yeah. It just evaporated. Uh -huh. Why? It's hopelessness or something of that sort, or a feeling that the, the, ch the, re the change that Ross is talking about is just too enormous. I think it's, to I, I think it's an effect an effect of the culture of narcissism. I, I do think that our culture for many years, since around 1950, has been deteriorating or being increasingly taken over with this pathology called narcissism. Uh, people find it harder and harder to get their minds off themselves, to even recognize the reality of other people, that other people are real. Um, some of the younger analysts are encountering more and more patients who come saying they're not sure that other people are not artificial intelligent, yeah. you know. Oh, absolutely. Yes, no, I saw somebody who thought they're a meme, a meme in a computer program. However, it's quite an interesting. Yeah. It gets into. <laughs> so it's spreading narcissism and identity yeah. politics fits with that. Look, I, I mean, people who have suffered from racism, sexism, heterosexism, they have a right to be upset and to oppose those social evils. I'm not trying to detract from the justice of their causes. Um, but I think you can be someone who works against racism and at the same time work against corporate capitalism. I mean, these are not mutually exclusive fights. Well, I, I think, just, sorry, I'm to be just a book, but I think, in right. a way, this is, uh, a, 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 we can think like this, we're not literally, well, are we, are we not as always big as this sort of woke thing, but we're still in, we're still thinking about things in a site, in an individual way. Mm. And of course, you know, you're saying this, but all these problems are created by it, certainly in England, the, the, the Thatcher won against the miners, uh, anti-trade union laws, atomization. Yes. People, you know, the miners knew that the BBC were reversing the footage, not because they were weird conspiracy theories, because they were there, because they knew the police attacked them and they knew the BBC reversed it. And as soon as you separate people, um, that, that, that's the problem. There's no working class communities, there's no strong trade unions and they have no power. So in a way we are... People are just, yeah, they're, they're, atomized they're, 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 individuals. Yeah, and the where the narcissism comes from. So in a way, we can't individually. Well, we we can, but on on a mass scale, then there might have to be something pretty nasty and narcissistic to happen to reverse it. Which is why revolutions fail, maybe, or or don't fail, maybe. Yeah. Um, there's a large sign of majority who haven't said very much. Um, any any other questions um, or uh, contributions people would like to make? <clears throat> yes, Leila, Leila Alata. Hi, I don't Hi. find the hand, sorry. Okay. Um, uh, I was surprised that you said identity politics is not sort of relevant because I find that identity politics and environmental crisis are the same thing, or um, sort of they symbolize the same thing, which is an attack on the environment of the child in terms of identity politics and an attack on the environment of us as human beings. So they're, they're really a serious issue. Um, the other thing is um, subsuming the con conscious on, on the Super ego is that Freud's agenda because he had to be food religion, and it's got the antidote to narcissism really, and that's what psychoanalysis is fighting against. Um, Interesting. Okay, well, 
Freud subsuming conscience into superego, I mean, um, oh boy, I could get into really dangerous territory here. I mean, Freud, Freud, Freud was um, Jewish, and, and uh, Judaism is about the law. And Jesus, the Jew, came and attacked the law. Man is not made for the Sabbath. Sabbath is made for men. Let him who is without sin cast the first stone. And he got crucified for that. I mean, Jesus represents the voice of conscience calling superego to account, insisting that the superego be judged by the standard of conscience. And yet Jesus said, think not that I come to uh, destroy the law or the prophets. I do not come to destroy, I come to fulfill. And we need the law. We need Moses. But we also need conscience um, to call out the law and to call the, the law to account. Um, so Freud, it is very hard for many Jewish thinkers to go down this path. They sense it's a Christian path. Someone has to write the secret history of Christianity in psychoanalysis. Donald Winnicott converted to Anglicanism. Ronald Fairbairn was headed for the Presbyterian priesthood. Um, uh, there's a whole thing going on there that no one has really made explicit, you know, that should be made. I'm too old and blind to write this book, <laughs> but I, I wish someone would. Um, now, as to your point about, oh, no, I didn't mean to to dismiss identity politics. I, I mean the opposite. I believe all of the identity politics concerns are valid concerns, but why are they forgetting about capitalism? That's all. I just want them to pursue identity ca uh, politics, but to pursue anti-capitalist politics at the same time. Elena, do you want to come back to any of that? Um. I guess I'm, I'm not sure. I, um, I don't understand, I guess, the, the difference when you say um, Moses is the Lord, Jesus is the uh, conscience, because for me, they're both prophets that came with a message um, from God. So it's quite split as well that one doesn't speak to the other in terms of well, faith. But I guess it's... Um, well, there's a great work of theology, know, but, uh, a great theological work by Pelican, four volumes, um, and there's a big discussion of this. This is also very much St. Paul. Um, and uh, there is, in, in Christian theology, there's a widespread recognition of the distinction between uh, the law and the gospel. Um, and, um, I mean, you know, dragging, positing conscience as against superego is just really my attempt in a secular language that will the psychoanalysts will listen to. If I start going on about Moses and Christ, no one's going to listen to me. So, <laughs> so I don't write about this. But is this in the background of what I'm saying? Of course it's in the background I'm saying. But, yeah. but I, I, I mean, I think it's valid. I think it's a valid distinction between an ethic of forgiveness on the one hand and an ethic of judgment on the other. These are very different forms of ethical practice. I think we need them both. For a while, I got enthused because in one of his late papers, Freud called for the actual demolition. That was his word, not mine. The demolition of the superego was the goal of psychoanalysis. Franz Alexander agreed. Shandor Ferenc, he said, no analysis is complete until there is the complete elimination of the superego. They thought that the moral function could be handed over to the ego, which is a mistake, because the ego is merely rational, and it can't posit values. That's why we need, that's why we need conscience. But for a while, I was all enthused about demolishing the superego, and then I realized, no, we can't demolish. We need a book of rules. We need the so, law. So is there, is there a theoretical implication to considering conscience as something innate? Yes, there is. I, I, it's widespread. What would that be? Well, the, uh, the primate studies show that uh, our fellow primates uh, also have an ethic. They have conscience. They have altruism towards one another. They help one another. They sacrifice themselves to help their fellows. And the infant research at Yale by Bloom has shown that little kids between three and six months already know right from wrong. 
I mean, they, they put on this little drama where there's a fuzzy animal trying to push a billiard ball up a ladder. But just as he's starting to get there, a red rabbit comes and pushes him down. This happens two or three times. The third time he's pushing it up, the blue rabbit comes and helps him succeed. Then they bring out on trays the blue rabbit and the red rabbit for the kids to choose. And the kids all choose the good, helpful rabbit, not the bad red rabbit. And this is like at three months, three to six months, um, because we're primates. We have an intrinsic understanding of, of reciprocity and fairness. I, I, I once put it this way, in every playground anywhere in the world you'll go, you'll, you'll, you'll hear kids saying, that's not fair, you had your turn, now it's my turn. Yeah. That's intrinsic. Yeah, thank you. Yeah. It made me think of Mark Swan's work and that consciousness, not conscious, but consciousness, has no purpose uh, um, for our survival, but we, which is uh, um, almost a mind-boggling question, why do we have it? And in the same way, we do have conscience then for a reason as well. And yes, yeah. Because thank God we're animals still. Yeah, thank God, David. <laughs> yeah. Well, the, the move from external authority of God to developing the internal conscience is a bit... Yeah. Yes. We should go back to religion, even though it, it, it sort of simplifies things. Well, a, a certain interpretation of religion. I mean, so much that religion did was working in the other direction, right? Yeah. Yeah. But that's, Max Weber understood that. He, he wrote about the routinization of charisma. A great leader, Jesus comes along, and then the bureaucrats build a, a bureaucracy based on his name, which represents the opposite of what he stood for. Uh, the same thing could be said about Karl Marx and Sigmund Freud, the IPA. <laughs> Thank you very much. Thank you. Yeah. Okay, Roger, we haven't got anybody else, but I, I, I'll have you, as I, you can give, Roger, you can have the last word, in your poetic way. No, put your sound on, put your sound on. All right. Yeah, that's it. There we are. Um, yeah, I mean, if we had all these good things innately, then, you know, why do we have psychopathology? Symbolic consciousness. Language. Well, that's where the psychopathology comes from. Well, that's what allows us to be both the rational and the deeply irrational animal. I mean, we are able to completely baffle ourselves. We're able to lie to ourselves and other people. We can dance with words. We can create delusions. We can kill ourselves. Yeah, I think it's an over. I think I think our linguistic ability. Well, we are the animal that destroys ecosystems. We are deregulated in that sense. We 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 got free from instinctual regulation. This is Eric Fromm again, by the way. Uh, Eric Fromm, a lot of, I wrote a paper called Eric Fromm's Existentialism. People forget, um, they think he's, um, you know, a rebel against Freudian biologism, but they think he succumbed then to the culturistic school and became like a sociologist. No, he was an existentialist. He refers to man as the freak of nature, the animal that woke up. And yeah. proceeded to destroy ecosystems and destroy himself. And build beautiful things. Bach, Beethoven. Uh, we create beauty with this symbolic functioning, but we destroy everything with this symbolic functioning. Okay, I think uh, we're going to have to wind up. And I'm sure there are lots of people with questions who haven't been able to... Uh, bring them, symbolize them and bring them online. But um, I hope uh, uh, 
if you do have questions, you can send them to me and I'll forward them to Don. Uh, yeah, it's David, been a, that'd be good. A wonderful, you know, wonderful dance of words and ideas, Don. A good one, not a not a cycle. <laughs> <laughs> Thanks, David. Thank you, uh, everyone. You no, know, we end up being God and religion tonight, but um, yeah, <laughs> I think we have we have, probably have to at some point. So right. Um, thank you very much, and thank you everybody. I just um, thank you, Don. Wonderful, wonderful. Most time. welcome. It was a great, um, great afternoon. Week, Thank you. And just to say for next week, you've got um, from disdain to appreciation, um, immigration and psychic borders. I'm sure some of these ideas will be around in that talk as well. Uh, they wish to externalize into other people, uh, our own bad aspects of ourselves we don't want to think about. Right. So um, once more, thank you, Don, and good night, everybody. Good night. And uh, next week. Bye. Bye. Thanks, Don. Thank Speak you, David. Well.